Okay, if you have been with us for the last several weeks, we have been in a, this is the sixth week of a six-week series called All In, and we've been talking through kind of who we are as a church, our, our vision, our mission, and then how do we carry those out. And if you have been with us, uh, you've seen this, and we're going to put this on the screen. This is our vision. If you haven't, this will be new to you, but what is the vision of Osceola Baptist Church? What is it that we're hoping to accomplish? And this is the vision, to bring hope to all people by inspiring them to desire a deeper relationship with Jesus. That's the goal, that we want to bring hope to all people. How many of you know that people in our world need a little bit of hope? Amen? Amen. All right, some of you are with me. The rest of you will catch on. We want to bring hope to not just some people, but all people. Because all people need hope. And how do we do that? We bring hope to all people by inspiring them. That means we have to live our life in a a specific way, a certain way, that people look at us and go, man, whatever it is that they have, I want that. And so we want to live inspiring lives so that people will see us and go, I want a deeper relationship with Jesus. Are we living our life in such a way? And that's the goal is that us as a church that all of us members, that we would live our lives in such a way that other people would desire a deeper relationship with Jesus. Now, the other thing that we've talked about is the how. How do we do that? So that's the the why. That's the why we exist. So what are we going to do about it? How do we do this? And that's the mission. And the mission is just simply these words, invite. We want to invite all people, right, into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we want to invite people to come and be a part of our church, That's what we want. That's our desire. We want people to come in so that they can experience the love of God that is experienced through his church. The second thing is to be involved. We want to involve people in the mission. It's not fun to sit on the sidelines. We want people in the game. We want you to not spectate. We want you to participate. It takes all of us to make the vision and mission happen. And God gifted you. He saved you. He gave you a spiritual gift for the purpose of getting involved. And that's the second step. So when people come into the church, we want to get them involved in ministry. We want God to so use your life to make much of him. Because when you do that, when we do that, when we make much of, when we make much of God through our life, then what happens is we get to experience this beautiful thing called joy. The third step in that is we want you to be invested in and we want to we want people to invest in you. We want you in groups. That's what we've been talking about for a little bit this morning. We want you to be in a group because we all need to be invested in and we all need to be investing in others. Okay. And then lastly, the the last step is once you come in and you get involved and you're investing and people are investing in you, we want you to go back out and increase the kingdom. It is the outward focus ministry of our church. We want to make disciples. That's the calling that Jesus has given us. So while having a good vision and having a good mission are very important, there is a third element that is is almost as important, if not maybe more important, than the vision and mission. And you're going, well, what could possibly be more important than a vision and mission? That's what we're about. That's the why we exist. That's the how we do what we do. What could be more important? Well, it's this word right here. We're going to put it on the screen. Culture. Now, why is culture more important than a vision and mission? I mean, you've got to know why you exist, and you've got to know how to do what it is that you're going to do. Well, let me, let me say this. I want to give you a quote real quick. A guy named Peter Drucker, who is a business expert, he wrote these words in talking about organizations, whether it, and it doesn't matter what kind of organization, whether it's a church or a business, it doesn't matter. But here's what he said. He said, culture eats strategy for breakfast, okay? Culture eats strategy for For breakfast. Another way I have heard it said is culture trumps vision. You can have the perfectly articulated vision statement. You can have you can have very clearly identifiable steps to take in order to accomplish that vision, but if the culture is bad, the vision and mission will not happen. So let me just say this: culture then is the number one killer. A vision. You know, we watch all these commercials and we watch these statistics about health things and this is the number one killer of whatever. Well, the number one killer of vision and mission in any organization, especially in a church, is culture. So we have to make sure that while we've identified our vision and while we've identified our mission, we have to, and by the way, this is an every one thing, every one of us are responsible for helping to cultivate and create a culture that is conducive to fulfilling the vision and mission. Okay? Now, let me put this on the screen for us. Our experience, I think it's going to be up there. Here we go. Our experience is shaped by what? Culture as much as it is shaped by content. 
our experience, how we experience the world, how we experience church and how we experience our church in particular is shaped as much by culture as it is by content. Listen, we can stand up here and sing the best songs. We can stand up here and sing the best, latest, oldest, doesn't matter, worship songs that there are. We can, we can spend hours, and, and Clint does a very good job of praying through um, and, and just considering theologically sound worship music so that we are singing words that are appropriate and right in alignment with scripture. We can do all those things. And whoever's on this platform, whether it's me or someone else, we can stand up here all day long and we can preach to the best of our ability these messages that are doctrinally and theologically sound, that we can take from the word of God and we can preach these things. And all of that would be good. We can have connect groups on Sunday mornings filled with people who are teaching great material and great content. We can have the best teachers on the planet put in every single classroom. But if the culture is not healthy, it doesn't matter. The culture trumps vision. So let me explain it this way. Okay, so if if our experience is shaped by culture as much as it is content, let me help illustrate it for us. Now, I want you to think for just a second about your favorite restaurant, okay? Whatever that is. Whatever your favorite restaurant is, what is it? And I want you to think about your experiences at that restaurant, okay? Now, we've all been to restaurants where the food was good, right? Like, we go and you go, oh, man, that food was fantastic. But have you ever been to a place where you've gone to this restaurant, highly recommended, you go there, and the food was incredible, like the flavor was great. You just had to wait two hours to get it. They forgot your... They forgot your reality, the fact that you were in the restaurant. They forgot your order. They forgot everything about you. So the food was great, but the experience was what? It was bad. So let me ask you a question. How was your experience? Bad, right? Like the food was fantastic. It got there three hours late, right? And the bread and water, the little, or the nachos and salsa, they had all run out. But if the food was great and the service was lousy, then your experience was not good. Or, hey, let's flip that around the other way. Let's say that the food was lousy, but the service was fantastic. Okay? How was your experience? It was bad, right? Like, it was bad. Like, that lady, she was the sweetest lady on the planet. Or that guy, he was so prompt, he always made sure that my tea was refilled. But the food was absolutely awful. So, this is my point in this. If, the, if we look at this, like our experience is shaped by the culture as much as it is the content. The food can be good, but if the experience is bad, if the, if the service is bad, then the, then the whole experience was just bad. And in the same way, we can prepare the most phenomenal, engaging life, you know, we connect groups possible. We can put the best teachers in the classrooms, and they can be the best ones possible. We could put the best musicians. We could bring in whoever your favorite group is, whether it's the Gaither Vocal Band or whether it's Hillsong. It doesn't matter. We could bring them in here. But if the experience out here is bad, then none of this matters. Culture trumps vision. And so we have to be careful about cultivating the right kind of culture. See, here's the thing that we need to understand, and I think we all get this, right? People don't typically quit on Jesus, right? I mean, how many times have you seen someone who quit attending a church, you found them out in the community, and you said, hey, we've been missing you at church. Yeah, I don't like Jesus anymore. You ever heard that one? Not me, right? Like, people don't quit on Jesus. As a matter of fact, I'll even say this, people don't even really quit on the big C church. Like, people don't quit on the church. Do you know what people quit on? They quit on cultures. And when we think about the church, and we think about the church hurts that we have faced in the past, you didn't face church hurt because Jesus hurt you. You didn't face church hurt because people were being obedient to what the Word of God said. You faced church hurt because... Someone stepped outside of the instructions of the word of God and they hurt you. And then your church hurt. That's a culture. And then that's when people leave. They don't quit on Jesus. They don't quit necessarily on the church. They just quit on culture. So 
with that being understood by all of us, how do we then cultivate and create a culture? First of all, what I need to impress upon us this morning is that if we're going to be successful in our mission and in our vision, the one thing that we all need to own, that we all have ownership in. See, I kind of hate the word um, member, like because we're church members. You join the church, you become a member. See, members have rights. Like if you're a member of a country club and you show up, you have rights to whatever is in there, right? If you're a member of a gym, when you go to that gym, you have rights inside of that gym. I don't really particularly like the word member. What, I, what would be a better word would be owner because we all have ownership in what is happening in the church. See, owners, while members have rights, ownership has responsibilities. When you own a house, you're responsible for fixing the house up. When you own a car, it's your responsibility to take care of the car. When you have a family, when you're kind of owning, owning your family environment, it's not someone else's responsibility. It's your responsibility. Okay, Members have rights. Owners have responsibility. And what we need to do is we need to own the, our part in creating the culture that's necessary in order for us to fulfill our vision and mission. And that responsibility belongs to every single person and it's going to require us to be radically committed to creating the culture. Now, what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, first of all, you, you need to understand something about yourself. You and I, we are culture creators. Did you know that? Did you know that you were a culture creator? I mean, we were created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. Do you know what God, so God created us in his image to be a representation of him in the world. Did you know, you know what God does? God creates cultures. He created by speaking. Do you know how we create cultures? We create cultures by speaking. Let me, uh, let me show you this in scripture, Proverbs 18, 21, one of my favorite passages because of the truthfulness behind it. Death and life are in the power of what? The tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So what the writer of the proverb right here is telling us is he's saying that you and I, when we speak, we speak cultures into existence. When we speak, we create environments that other people live in. We have to understand that we are culture creators. Every single one of us has a right and a responsibility within this culture. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. As a church family, we all have a responsibility for culture. We cannot fulfill the vision and mission when we have an unhealthy culture. And we create unhealthy cultures by the words that we choose to use, how we communicate with people. You ever, you ever been in one of those awkward moments where maybe a husband and wife begin an argument in like a public setting? Like everyone in that environment, in that moment, feels what? Awkward. Like, all right, hey, let's hurry up and get out of here because this is not fun, Right? In the same way, it, it's the same way in churches. When churches create and cultivate arguments, when we, when we continually disagree with one another, when we, when we create environments where people feel like, I need to keep my guard up because I don't know who's going to come after me within the body of Christ, that creates an unhealthy culture. When we have an unhealthy culture, we are never going to inspire people to desire a deeper relationship with Jesus. And that is the vision. So in that moment, the vision is dead. And we will not invite people because you know what we won't invite people to? Like if you know... Um, if you know that you're about to go to a family meeting where there is going to be a very hard conversation over the breakdown of an inheritance, right? You don't invite your buddy or a friend, hey man, why don't you join me? Like you should come in and this is going to be a hoot. You should come. This is going to be a whole lot of fun. Like no one invites people into that. And in the same way, when there's conflict going on inside of a church family, do you know what no one does? No one invites people into that. Like we, when, when, the, when the conflict in the culture, when the conflict gets bad and the culture grows toxic within a church, people quit inviting other people into the church because you don't feel, you, in, in, in our heart for people, we want to protect them from things that are harmful to them. And we would never want to leave a, a moment or, or create an opportunity for somebody to come into something that might prevent them from ever attending another church again because Again, everybody in their, in their thoughts, in their minds, they have this idea of what they th think church might be like because they've heard stories. Let me read you, um, I want to read you a, 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 an excerpt from National Geographic. Before I read that, though, I want us to understand something. Um, creating a culture for, for us means that we are going to fight for the culture, that we're going to fight for the health of the culture. Not, not just... 
You know, like it's everybody else's responsibility to fight for the culture. It's my responsibility to fight for the culture. It's your responsibility. We have to all take ownership in that. Let me give you kind of a from nature example of what I mean by that. In May of 1987, there was an article written in a National Geographic that included a feature about an Arctic wolf. Okay? And it was written by uh, David Metch. He described how a seven-member pack of, of these um, musk oxen calves were guarded by 11 adults. So you can get the picture, right? Like there's seven little calves, and, and these 11 oxen adults surround the calves because these, this pack of wolves has shown up, and the pack of wolves is hungry. And, of course, the pack of wolves, what they typically go after are the weakest, right? So they're, they're after the calves. So here's how these... These, these oxen, this is how they protect them. The 11, the 11 adults surround the calves with their rears facing outward because the reason that their rears are facing outward is the most powerful part of their body is their back legs. It's where they kick, and it's a powerful kick. And because of that, the calves remain safe during this long standoff with uh, these, this pack of wolves. But then the article reads... One ox broke rank. One. And the herd scattered into nervous groups. And a skirmish ensued, and the adults finally fled in a panic, and all of the calves were eaten. See, Paul warns us, in, and he warns the elders in Acts chapter 20, that after his departure, he said, wolves will come. And not sparing the flock. Wolves continue to attack the church today. But they cannot do it if we fight for the culture. And that's where we all have to be committed. We have to be committed to fighting for the culture. Even when it's not convenient. Even when it hurts. Even when it... Because, listen, Jesus fought for the culture of heaven when he went on the cross. It was not comfortable. It was not easy. As a matter of fact, Jesus, even in his moment of despair while he's praying in the garden of Gethsemane he says God if you would let this cup pass for me that's how that's how excruciating it was he said nevertheless not my will be done but yours and it's the same thing that you and I are going to have to pray on a daily basis if we are going to fight for the culture yes it's sometimes not going to be easy yes it's going to sometimes not uh, come come across uh, well in in our own soul and spirit but we have to be willing to pray and think the same way that Jesus did that our prayer would be, not my will be done, but yours. So what our, so then, okay, great, awesome. You build an argument for uh, culture is better than vision. It's, it trumps vision. It's more important than vision, or it's at least equally important. And then you've built an argument for the fact that we all, as a church, should take ownership in the responsibility of fighting for the culture. Well, what is that? That should be your next question. And I'm glad you asked, because I do have an answer, at least. All right, so if you're taking notes, please take notes. If you, it's not really hard to remember. There's four things, but, but I, and, and there, we could add more, we could whatever, but I, four things is easier to remember than 400. So what are the cultural values that we should be chasing after? Number one, love God. Let me read you Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> Matthew 22, 37 says this, and he said to them, you shall what? Okay. I'm going to start slowing down to a crawl because apparently I'm not communicating well. So I will go slower unless you guys all want to join along. At least then I know that we're communicating with one another. All right. Like, all right. So let's do this all together now, church. We can do it. All right. Uh, And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God. Yes. With what? All. All. That's a big word, right? Because we're in the all in series with all your heart and with your soul and with all. all. Yeah, all. He said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your mind. Can I ask you a very, very relevant question this morning? Do you love God? Now, it's easy for us to say that. Do you love God? What does it mean to love God? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind. How do we do? What does it mean? 
What does it mean to love God? How do we love God? See, love is not just like we throw this word around a lot. I love my wife. I love my children. I love pizza. I love the Florida Gators. <laughs> Touche. All right. <laughs> Those two loves, we would all agree, are different, right? Like loving your family, loving your wife, loving your children, loving your parents, and loving things, two different types of love. So when we say, when I ask the question, do you love God, how are you interpreting that? Do you love the idea of God? Do you love the reality that God has done some things on your behalf in order to purchase a salvation that you and I could never purchase? Or do we genuinely love Yahweh, Jehovah? Do we love the person of God? This is a massively important question because if there is not a genuine yes to this question, then there will never be a yes to the other questions. If there's not a yes to this question, then all of the other cultural goals become impossible. Because it all starts with, I love you, God. Like you. I, 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 I love you. I love your word. I love, I love everything about you. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be worshipped. You are worthy to be followed. Do I genuinely love God? And the reason, again, that I, I bring all this up, I want to read you another passage of Scripture. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God. You guys are catching on. All right. For this is the what again? Love of God. So this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So what does that mean? Like I have to, if I love, in order for me to love God, I have to keep all of his commandments, but I thought no one can keep his commandments. True. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, that we have a desire to keep his commandments. Do you have a desire to keep his commandments? Or here's what we can often all be guilty of. Leveraging the verses in the Bible that we like and going, those I will keep. Those they should keep. But what about, you ever had God just get all up in your Kool-Aid? You know what I'm talking about? Like you know something's there and God is going, like the Holy Spirit is screaming at you. Like you know you shouldn't do that. You know you shouldn't say that. You know you shouldn't behave that way. God is just all over you. And then what do we do in that moment? Do we go, God... I love you, and because you say so, I will. Or do we just turn up the volume of something else just a little louder? God, don't make me go there. God, don't make me forgive that person. God, don't, ma don't make me. And the question becomes, so this is the most important of all of our cultural questions, and this is the one that we've got to get right if any of the others are ever going to be right. Do we, do I, do you love God. Do I love God? Second cultural value that I think that we should be pursuing um, is, number two, is this, that we should love people. Okay? Love God. Love people. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, look at this verse. Very convicting. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. That is from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit penned by John. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And here's what we go. This is how we do, right? This is, this is kind of, I don't hate them. I don't, I don't hate anybody. I love everybody. I just don't like them, right? That's, that's, the, that's the churchy way of, of dodging, sidestepping that command of God. Because whoever loves God will keep his commandments. 
right? But then we're told that anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. I want to read you this quote from a guy named Charles Spurgeon. You may have heard of him. Charles Spurgeon said this, We shall not long have love to man if we do not first and chiefly cultivate love to God. If you have love problems in your heart towards another person and you can't love, whether it's, a, whether it's an individual, whether it's people in a political party, whether it's people of another team, hello, somebody, right? <laughs> whether, <laughs> if, if, we, if we don't have love for people, it may be an indicator it may be like the check engine light that comes on that you can't get to turn off. Do you know what we do? I was having this conversation with Cliff Tankersley. He was telling me how his check engine light was coming on. And, you know, I mean, those things come on sometimes, and it's just like, what do you do, right? It's like a O2 sensor or something. I don't know. And so it's like, well, my car runs fine, but the check engine light is on. When, when we... And what do we do? What do we do? Like a lot of us, a lot of us, when that check engine light comes on, if the car's running, we might get it checked out. We might not. We might just kind of hope that thing goes off because, you know, I read somewhere that if you start it after seven times of starting, if it was like a fault, because it could have been a faulty light, like it could have just, something could have triggered it, a piece of trash got in somewhere and suddenly the light came on. And what I've read online somewhere is that if I just start it after about the seventh or eighth time, that light will just go back off. And sometimes it does. I've been there before. Right? Like, yes, it was an O2 sensor, and the guy said, hey, look, man, that just, if you, it, it, it probably a piece of trash, gotten cylinder, whatever, whatever, and after a while, that thing will just clear itself after so many starts, and it does. And I think that that's what happens sometimes when we deal with the Holy Spirit. The check engine light comes on and says, bing, 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 hey, you need to forgive. You need to not treat that person this way. You need to not harbor any bitterness towards these people. And then what do we do? Uh, that's just a check engine light. It's all good. I'm good. I'm good. I don't. I don't hate. I just don't like some people. That is not of God. Because we have been given a ministry of reconciliation. We, how can we have a ministry of reconciliation if we are not ourselves reconciled to all people? How? It's impossible. And so quit ignoring the check engine light and respond appropriately to what God has called you to do. In the thing that we need to understand with this <clears throat> is that we will, we will never lead people well if we do not love people well. We cannot lead people well that we don't love. Well, our vision, mission, and message will never be receivable if our love for people is not believable. See, our, like, that. okay, great. What's your vision and mission? Great statement. Fantastic. Love that. It will not be receivable if our love for other people is not genuine and believable. Like, it's just not going to happen. People, like, you ever, you ever been around people that you felt uncomfortable around, like, I don't know, there's just something about them. I don't, like, I don't know if I should keep my hand on my wallet or, like, I just don't. You've been around people like that before. It should never be that way in the church. Like, we should never have to walk into church and put our guard up because we're afraid of how we might get treated while we're there. I, I've had conversations recently with people who would be formerly from here. And do you know why they don't come back? Because people have treated them horribly. How is that even possible? How can we, as followers of Jesus Christ, ever treat anyone that way when we have been forgiven of so much? It should never be so in the church. And so what we want to do is cultivate and create a culture where when people walk in here, they go, whoo, those people love God, man, that is incredible. And, man, they just love people. Like, I felt so warm and I felt so accepted. And I just feel like when I go here, I can just let my guard down. Because it's interesting. And... Um, In James chapter 1, James says this really, uh, James chapter 5, I'm sorry. He says these really difficult words. It sounds difficult for all of us. He says that, that we are to confess our sins to one another that we may be healed. 
So confessing sins to people helps us get healed. This isn't like a Catholic church thing where we're going to have a confession booth and you come in and talk to me. He's like one another. We should confess our sins to him. Do you know what people in the church today will never do? They'll never confess their sins to each other. Why? Because we don't trust each other. And it shouldn't be that way. A healthy church and a healthy ch church culture where we love God and people know that we love God and they know that we love them, we, know, we love people regardless, when we do that, when we create that culture, that is the kind of culture that will enable the vision and mission to be possible. That is inspiring. I want to be a part of cultures like that, and so do you. But it's every person's responsibility to create that. So how we treat people matters. Here's a question, okay? By the way, I don't think I said this a while ago, but I, I do want to make sure that we do this. Um, and under point one, where we're talking about loving God, here is a prayer for all of us this week, okay? I want you to pray this. God, help me to love you more. That is your prayer for this week in that context. God, help me to love you more. In this second section, as we talk about loving people, uh, it, it does matter how we treat people. And I want you to answer this question real quick. Who is it? Who is it? Who is it that you need to forgive? <clears throat> Who is it that you keep making excuses to be mad at? Who is it that you attempt to justify your anger and bitterness over? Who is it that you keep ignoring the check engine light on? Who is that? Again, 1 John 4.20 says, if, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not love his brother any whom he, if he cannot love his brother whom he has seen, then he cannot love a God whom he has not seen. See, we need to, here's, here's a couple points. How, here, so how can we do that? How can we do that? Number one, um, we need to learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. Do you know it's okay to not agree? I don't agree with y'all that George is the best team, whatever. Like, but I still don't have to be disagreeable. I still get to come in and go, how Taylor, how'd your dogs do? You know, like Kurt and Sherry Wilmot, like I know they're no fans. And we go, hey, like, Kurt comes up to me and says, hey, neither of us lost yesterday. It was fantastic. I mean, we got to celebrate together. And, you know, we're, we're rivals, right? We can do that. We can do that because, because we, have, we can learn how to disagree without being disagreeable. We need to learn that in the church. If we could learn that in the church, like, okay, hey, I don't agree with you on that, but that's okay. Love you just the same, right? It's all good. We're, we're fine. Like, I, I want... Maybe we could have further conversation about that, and you can help me see your point of view. How, how amazing would that be in our culture today? And then here's a second question, just kind of following up to that. Are my feelings more about me, or is it about them? In other words, am, is, is this conflict and this, this thing that I feel, is it, is it an issue that where I'm insisting on my own way, because here's the reality, insisting on our own way can get in God's way of what he wants to do in the other person's life and even in your life. So am I insisting on my own way? Again, insisting on our own way can get in the way of what God wants to do. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And he's talking about love, and so you, that's why the or rude is kind of like right there. That, that, that's relevant too. But um, love does not insist on its own way. Love doesn't insist on its own way. And those are, that's an important sentence in that definition of love that Paul gives. So for loving people, I want, here's the prayer for this week, okay? And everybody just, if you would, lean into this tension with us. Um, pray this. God, there's two things. God, help me to love everyone the way you love everyone. Not just the people that I pick. Like, I love these people, them, man, whatever. No, help me to love everyone for God so loved the, yeah, it didn't say for God so loved the fill in the blank, for God so loved the Stevens that he gave his life, for God so loved the Fairfields that he gave his life, for God so loved the Lowe's that he gave his, no, he said for God so loved the world. That means the people even that you currently have in your head as the Holy Spirit revealed that to you a minute ago when I said, who is it? And you knew that person God loves. And we don't need to stand in the way of God doing what God needs to do in the life of people that we disagree with. The next thing that you could pray, God, <clears throat> help me to disagree without being disagreeable. God, would you help me in this? Because I can't do it on my own. I, the Holy Spirit, like my flesh pushes against it. Like there's, there are people that we can think of that when we think of them, like our, our blood pressure goes up. 
right? Like we can get fighting angry over just thinking about people who have wronged us. If Jesus can look down on the cross, from the cross at people who put him on the cross and say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Certainly we should be able to do that. But we'll never be able to do it in the flesh. We will only ever be able to do that as long as we are leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us. All right, pray. Those are the things that I would love for us to pray through as a church when it comes to loving people. Uh, the last couple, and we'll close out real quick. Um, third, third cultural value, choose excellence. Choose excellence. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any what? Excellence. If there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Choose excellence. You can only pursue excellence, right? Because you can never attain it. Like we can, it's always a thing that you're pursuing. No matter how good we get, no matter how much we improve things, the closer we, like as we move towards improvement and as we move towards excellence, it's kind of like the rainbow. You know what I'm talking about? You've been driving down the road, you're in the back seat of your parents' car, and you're like, ooh, we're going to get to the end of the rainbow. As you kept driving, the rainbow kept moving, okay? Excellence is the same way. We are pursuing it. Does it mean that maybe we'll ever ultimately arrive? Because whenever we get to whatever we wanted to make excellent, there's always going to be something else that we need to make excellent. Um, somebody once said, you gain repeat customers by providing a comfortable experience. You, you gain repeat customers by providing a comfortable experience. You know what creates comfort? Excellence. Back to the restaurant illustration, if your food is excellent and your service is excellent, you're comfortable. And you're like, man, we will go back there again. So let's not pursue good enough, and let's not give God our leftovers. Let's pursue excellence. So here's our prayer in this area. Would you pray with me this week in this way? God, help me to serve you with excellence. Help me to serve you with excellence, okay? All right, last, uh, the fourth part of our cultural values. Choose joy. Choose joy. Happiness happens to you. Happiness is all about what happens to you. Joy is about what happens in you. You notice the difference, right? Like happiness, my circumstances, the happenings of the world are good to me right now, and so I am therefore happy. We won last night, I am happy. Last week, not so much, but, and maybe not next week, but right now, I'm happy. My football team won. Same thing with you. We're happy when the circumstances around us, the happenings to us, are good. But joy is different. See, everything around you can be falling apart, but joy comes from within, and it is what happens in you. And no matter what happens around you, God, as long as God is the source of your joy, then there is a, a joy that comes from within you, regardless of what your circumstances may be. Choose Joy. We went to a movie the other night, and all of you should go if you haven't been yet, and if you've been, you, could, you should go again. It's really good. It's called The Forge, okay? All right? It, it, people kept recommending it me to the point that I was like, okay, if that many people are saying I should go see it, then I am going to see it. So we went to see it, and there is a fantastic quote in that movie that I want to share with you, and when you see it, maybe it'll resonate with you. This comes back to choosing joy. Okay, when I choose joy, I can't, I can't choose my circumstances. Circumstances happen. But I can choose joy in all circumstances. And so joy speaks a, a lot of how do you receive me. And so here was the quote from the movie. The, the quote from the movie said this, be a fountain, not a what? Anybody? A drain, right? So there's the people that have seen the forge. Be a fountain, not a drain. Let's say that together. Be a fountain, not a drain. Let's say that one more time. Be a fountain, not a drain. And I don't even have to explain that to you because you've met some drains in your life, right? Be a fountain. How do we do that? When we choose joy, we become a fountain. We become a fountain that when we step into a room, it changes the culture of the room. And you know people like that. You've known people that when they walked into the room, man, the room just kind of lit up, right? That's who we should be. Jesus said that we are the light of the world, right? When people see you coming... Here's a question for you to answer, rhetorical. When people see you coming, 
do they move away from you or towards you? When people see you coming, do they move away from you or towards you? Because I can tell you this, when Jesus was walking this earth and doing his ministry, people flocked. Now, we do know later in life that they misunderstood who he was and they, they were part of the crowd, right, that had him crucified. But when Jesus was walking around doing his ministry, when his ministry was beginning, when his ministry was building, people flocked to Jesus, except for the people who didn't believe. So when people see you coming, do people move towards you or away from you? Are you approachable? Galatians 5.22, it's interesting to me that the first two fruit parts of the fruit of the spirit that Paul lists in Galatians. But the fruit of the spirit is what? Love and joy. Love and joy. If we love people and we have joy in our life, you know what? We will have no problem. We will have no problem creating a culture that allows the vision and the mission of Osceola Baptist Church to flourish. So what kind of culture are we creating? What kind of culture are we creating? Healthy cultures create healthy things. And we have a responsibility as individuals in this church to create a healthy culture. Um, so, I'm going to invite Clint uh, to come. He is going to lead us in a time of invitation. So I want to ask you today, as we think about these uh, four cultural values that we want to create as a church, in order that the vision and mission of Osceola Baptist Church might thrive and flourish... Will you make a commitment to love God more, to love people more, to choose excellence? I'm going to do everything with excellence. Like if no matter what it is, I'm going to choose excellence. And will I choose joy? Will I choose when, it, when there's a gap between what I expect and what I experience? Will I choose joy in the middle? Will I fill in that gap with the best possible scenario about the individual? Or will I just assume the worst? Love God, love people, choose excellence, choose joy. Those are the four cultural values that if we could, if we could embody as a church, will allow the vision and mission of Osceola Baptist Church to take off and thrive.